Okay, so uh, let's start uh, our last uh, morning session. Uh, the first speaker is Ru Ruth Heller, uh, who is a professor at the Department of Statistic, Statistics and Operation Research at Tel Aviv University. Uh, she is interested in multiple comparisons methods, non-parametric statistical tests, observational studies, statistical uh, genetics. Uh, and she, she got her PhD uh, under supervision uh, of Yoav Benjamini, who is co-developer of the widely used uh, false discovery rate concept and methodology. And after uh, her PhD, she had a position at Univer University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania uh, which was called Distinguished Scholar in Residence Visiting Lecturer of Statistics, and then a position at Technion. Uh, she also, um, in, uh, in um, uh, 2015, 2016, she was a visiting fellow at National Cancer Institute in Israel. Uh, Ruth Heller publishes in top journals, uh, both in theoretical statistics and uh, in applied journals related to economics, computational statistics, biology, bioinformatics, genetics, uh, machine learning. She also de develops software. Okay, Ruth, please start. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, hello. Um, thank you very much for this introduction, Eva, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so please feel free to interrupt because I really don't know the audience at all. I was told that uh, you're very bright, but you know nothing of statistics, or at least I cannot assume that you know uh, statistics. Although statistic has been so much in the news um, for the past couple of years that uh, probably all of us uh, uh, know a little bit of statistics at least now. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start by just introducing a very central topic in uh, this field, which is uh, hypothesis testing. And then I'm going to go uh, to uh, a specific problem in hypothesis testing, a very basic problem, is, uh, which is to find the relationship between uh, uh, two uh, random variables. And uh, there I'm going to discuss also some uh, modern research. So um, the first half uh, uh, will just uh, be really a tutorial uh, like on, on hypothesis testing. Um, and the second half will be, uh, will connect to more uh, uh, modern research. Um, all right, so let's uh, start with uh, hypothesis testing. Uh, so uh, we have data and uh, we want to, to infer from the data on unknown parameters or on a population. We can think that the data was generated uh, from a certain population or a certain probability or certain uh, a model uh, here uh, denoted by calligraphic uh, P. And uh, let's let's say think that we can um, it's it's basically a, a family of models indexed by unknown parameters theta, and uh, so we know that our data came uh, from this, and we want to infer on uh, the value of that parameter. Or more specifically, uh, we have uh, the null hypothesis, uh, we denote it here by age, which means uh, that data takes a certain uh, set of values in uh, big theta naught. Uh, that's the usual uh, situation, uh, um, the, 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 the existing state, say. And we have the complement of uh, this null hypothesis H. We call it the alternative hypothesis uh, K or the research hypothesis. Uh, this is what we actually want to prove. We want to, sh to, uh, to discover that something has changed. And now theta is no longer within this null set of values, but it is actually in the complement denoted here by big theta one. Okay, I, I have a question because you know I, sure. I don't know anything in statistics. So theta is. I mean, it's possible um, probability distribution, yes, that we, we have, 
Yeah, we, we are uh, yeah. Thinking, uh, uh, looking for a possible probability distribution. Yes. Yeah, yes. 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 Okay. The data denotes a, a probability distribution. Okay. That you generated uh, your data exactly the random variables that you observe, because what we have in statistics the opposite. I mean, in in uh, probability, uh, we know the probability distribution, and then we do all kinds of computations uh, with random variables. In statistics, it's the opposite. We actually observe the random variables, and from that, we want to learn on the probability distribution. So our starting point is this data, and we want to learn from it on uh, what where it came from, what P of theta was. Uh, so H uh, is the default, and uh, what we're going to do is either, based on the data, we're either going to not reject it, so we don't have any definite conclusion, or we're going to reject it and then conclude that indeed the research hypothesis is true, which means that it comes from a probability distribution that uh, uh, is indexed by a theta in, in this uh, big theta one set. And I think uh, the simplest is to, to take an example. So uh, 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 single mean problem, suppose uh, the probability distribution is just a Gaussian density, and uh, suppose it's a standard deviation is one, and we don't, we want to infer on the, uh, its expectation. In order to do that, what we observe is actually a sample of size n from this uh, uh, density. And what we uh, want, uh, and the null hypothesis is that the expectation is uh, uh, not, uh, it's not positive. Uh, what we want to uh, discover is whether the, the expectation is now positive. Uh, so in this case, uh, our, our uh, model, it's the set of all uh, normal theta one uh, uh, densities. Uh, theta, big theta naught is just uh, the values minus infinity to zero. And uh, uh, the research hypothesis is that uh, all positive values for the expectation. And we, we decide whether we are here or that we can conclude that, that we are here based on the data. Uh, another example is the one that I'm actually going to talk about uh, in the second uh, half of um, uh, the lecture, uh, which is uh, that uh, our, our model now is all joint distribution. Suppose we have uh, two uh, random variables, x and y, and we have a sample of size n from their joint distribution. And uh, the null hypothesis is that uh, X and Y are independent. So knowing X doesn't give me any information about Y, which means that the joint distribution does factor out into uh, the product of the marginal distributions of X and Y. And what we want to discover is that there is actually a relationship between X and Y. So based on these uh, N uh, pairs of observations, we want uh, to discover that um, uh, the joint distribution doesn't factor uh, into the product of the marginals, that they are dependent. So this is actually the problem I'm going to talk about uh, afterwards. But for now, we're just uh, building the language and the, uh, and the, and the way it's uh, uh, done in, in, in simple examples. Um, OK. So uh, uh, to be more formal, uh, we have um, we have our data. Uh, so I'm noting it. I mean, here the data, for example, was pairs of observations. Here it was a single sample, just uh, the cartoon uh, uh, way of denoting it. I'm just denoting it by x. Okay. Uh, so we have our data x, and based on that x, uh, we are making. Uh, we said we are making a decision: either we fail to reject the uh, the null hypothesis h, or we reject it, and then we conclude that the research hypothesis is true. Uh, so let's uh, denote this decision function uh, d that takes uh, our data, and then it gives a binary decision: either zero, which means we fail to reject the null, or one, which means that we reject the null. So uh, we have uh, the rejection region is just all the set of uh, realizations of the data, okay? Uh, that uh, uh, for them, we're going to decide to indeed reject the null and decide that our research hypothesis is true. 
Uh, what we have is the power function, uh, which is the probability of rejecting the null as a function of uh, theta. Remember, theta is what we don't know, what we want to infer about. But uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, power function, which is just the probability of, uh, of rejecting um, uh, the null hypothesis. Uh, so this as a function of uh, theta, this characterizes uh, the way we're doing our, our tests. Okay, so let's think what is, uh, I mean, th th this is defined even before we see the data yeah, yet, uh, but uh, we need to choose uh, our decision really something uh, the analyst chooses now how, how to do it. Uh, so what would be the ideal power function? Okay, what, what do we actually want uh, from this power function? I mean, as a, so if we think uh, we, we don't know where we are, we can be in uh, the truth is either that uh, the null hypothesis is correct or that uh, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, incorrect, but that's what we want uh, to decide on. So what we would like is if, if indeed uh, theta is in our null set, so the null hypothesis is true, uh, then we would like uh, the probability of doing rejection to be very small, right? We don't, or actually zero, that would be the best thing. But if uh, theta is actually in the alternative, so the uh, um, edge is false, then we want uh, to have a very high probability of indeed rejection, the rejecting. We take our uh, sample and uh, we look at it, we want to make this, uh, this decision. Sorry, may I have a question? Yes, of course. Uh, so R is the uh, the set of all random variables or or the the subset of the measurable space on which we operate. I'm a little bit confused. R, R is uh, yeah, R is the set of realizations uh, for which uh, we are going to um, uh, to to the, to decide to to reject uh, the the null hypothesis. So for example, uh, let, let's take uh, this this example here. Uh, so we can decide, so, so we have a sample, uh, a random sample of size n. Let, let's suppose it's uh, uh, heights in the population. Heights uh, are normally distributed. Now we okay. take a, a sample of say 100 people and we measure their heights. So this is our uh, realization. Uh, we, we are measuring their heights. So we have actually 100 numbers. Now no longer random variables, there are, there are 100 numbers. And based on these uh, 100 numbers, uh, we want to, uh, our, our um, research hypothesis is say that now uh, the, the average height is actually, uh, in the population is actually greater than, uh, I don't know, than 175 centimeters. Uh, so we want to decide whether uh, we can reject the null that it's uh, at most 175 centimeters based on our sample of uh, observations. Now suppose uh, um, um, what, what we, so, so here, what we put is all the realizations for which we are going to indeed decide uh, to, reject, uh, to reject the null hypothesis. So in the height example, it can be, okay, uh, we are going to take, uh, say, we're not going to look only at the average of the 100 people for simplicity. If the average is greater than 177 centimeters, then we're going to reject and otherwise not. So the rejection region is just uh, 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 177, uh, uh, greater than 177, basically. That will be all these values here. Okay, okay, I see, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. So, 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 but, but we can, I mean, it's a, a little bit of overload of uh, notations here, it's just because typically, I mean, if you look at the literature, you talk about rejection regions, but we can just uh, stick with the decision rule. It's just uh, all the values of X for which we're going to decide uh, uh, the, the decision will be, uh, the binary decision will be one. Okay. Now, uh, so, so uh, the question is, the real question is how to do the, do the um, the difficulty is uh, the art and the science is how, how to choose this decision function based on what values of X I'm going to say that the null is false and uh, decide to reject the null and based uh, and, and on the complement not to reject. Uh, so uh, the, the, the context is that what we have, we can do correct inference and incorrect inference, okay? And uh, 
what we have, uh, uh, so uh, our null hypothesis is either true or false, of course. And we have a decision, either we don't reject or we reject. So when do we do correct inference? Well, if the null hypothesis is true and we decide not to reject, we did the correct uh, inference. Uh, or if the null hypothesis is false and we, reject, we decide to reject, that's great also. We did correct inference. However, if uh, the null hypothesis is false and we don't reject, we uh, have a type two error. And if the null hypothesis is true and we do uh, reject, okay, we shouldn't reject, but we do reject, then we have a type one error. This is called uh, the false positive. Okay, what we want is actually uh, to have a small probability of uh, the errors, right? A small probability of a false positive, a type one error, and small probability of a type two error. That's what ideally uh, we would like. Now, the power function, remember, it's just defined as uh, the probability to actually uh, decide on reject, okay? Uh, so um, what we want is the probability, th this probability to be close to zero uh, when we're here and close to one uh, when we're here, okay? But uh, uh, what is the problem? In order, if we think about it, uh, how, how can we make, uh, I mean, here it's correct inference. How, could, uh, how can we make uh, the probability of rejecting uh, the null uh, closer to one? Well, we can decide that uh, there are more uh, realizations of our data. Uh, um, in the height example, it's equivalent to, to lowering the threshold. I said 177 centimeters before, but let's say, let's decide uh, more than 170 centimeters. Say then the probability, if indeed uh, the average uh, has, uh, the expectation has increased, if indeed it, this, this is true, then the probability now when I sample 100 people uh, that the average will indeed be greater than 170 will be closer to one than uh, the average of 100 people if, uh, if, if um, uh, the, the probability of being greater than 177, which was the threshold before. So, um, so, so the way to actually increase this probability to one when uh, the null hypothesis is true is by adding uh, more, val more realizations that will lead to a reject uh, age decision. The problem is that if I add more realization uh, for which I will decide to reject age, I'm not only increasing the probability of uh, correct inference when uh, the null hypothesis is indeed false, but I'm also increasing the probability of type one error when the null hypothesis is true, right? So I, I can't have it both ways. Um, so I, uh, if I'm reject more results, uh, uh, my power function will indeed be larger, but it will be larger both uh, for uh, if I am in, uh, in the null and if I want, am in the alternative. Um, so by adding the results, we increase both the power, which means uh, what I want to actually do. If I am in the alternative, I want the, the power to be as close to one as possible, but I'm also increasing uh, the probability of type one error. If the truth is this, I'm also increasing uh, the probability of making uh, that error. Um, so we can't uh, really uh, uh, maximize the power and, uh, you know, close, close to one and minimize uh, the type one error at the same time. That, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, so basically, both probabilities cannot be controlled simultaneously. Okay. Uh, so what, what uh, uh, can be done? Well, what is typically done is uh, uh, we don't treat the two errors uh, um, uh, in the same way. It's sort of like uh, in the judicial system uh, that uh, um, a person is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So we have to have really strong evidence against the null hypothesis uh, in order to actually decide to reject it because we want the probability of type 1 error to be small. That's the first thing that we're worried about. So first of all, we want this probability of type 1 error to be small. And then uh, once uh, we, we know that the probability of type 1 error is small, then we will decide uh, we will select the decision rule so that the probability of indeed rejecting the null uh, will be as high as we can. So th that is the scientific method. 
So uh, basically, we choose uh, um, alpha. That's the probability of type 1 error that we're going to use. Uh, alpha to be small. Typical value is the most prevalent one in uh, a lot of disciplines. It's 5%, but of course, it can be uh, other things as well. And then we constrain our decision rule to, so that it has to satisfy that the maximal probability of type 1 error, the maximum probability of a false positive, is at most alpha. Now, if uh, so we have a decision rule that satisfies this. And suppose now we have data and uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, it, the, the, uh, our decision rule is such that we say uh, reject, reject the null. What does it mean? It means either that indeed uh, we're rejecting because uh, the uh, uh, null hypothesis is false, right? We actually sampled from the alternative. Uh, or um, it is true, but we got a non-representative sample. We got something that has a probability of at most alpha of happening. Now, since we restricted alpha to be small, we're saying, okay, the probability of getting a non-representative sa sample is actually at most alpha. Uh, that's the doubt that we're allowing, okay? And then, despite that, we decided to reject. So beyond a reasonable doubt to, to uh, make it equivalent to the judicial system, we decide indeed to reject uh, to re reject the null and uh, and say that our research hypothesis uh, is true. Um, are there any questions? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's maybe a lot to take. Uh, okay. Fine. It's a very good explanation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so what we have in terms of the la uh, language, again, uh, that we're using, we have the significance level of our test is the maximum probability of type 1 error. And we say that our test, our decision policy, is a level alpha test if the significance level is indeed at most alpha. Okay. So we constrain uh, to the to, to uh, among all alpha level tests. Now we still have a degree of freedom of how to choose uh, our uh, decision policy. So what we like, of course, if the null hypothesis is true, we want uh, to have the highest probability to detect it. So we would prefer a decision policy with large power among all level alpha tests. Okay. Okay, so let's look uh, again at a very simple example. Um, uh, suppose uh, really a cartoon example, uh, we have uh, the uh, expectation of a normal uh, random value that we want to infer on. And we have only one data point. Suppose we have just one, uh, we just sample once from uh, uh, from this uh, this density, and from it we want to to conclude that the expectation is not zero. And the null hypothesis is that it is zero. Okay, so here are three decision functions, and they are all uh, alpha level tests. So uh, the first one will reject us if uh, uh, if our realization is larger than the one minus alpha quantile of uh, the standard normal distribution. That, that's uh, this is decision rule here. So if you look here at the standard, this is the standard normal density, uh, then it will reject. Uh, and if alpha is uh, the uh, value of uh, 5%, then we're rejecting if, uh, um, if uh, now we sampled our X and X was above uh, 1.645. So it's uh, then we're going to decide, okay, the null hypothesis is false. And uh, we conclude uh, the research hypothesis that the expectation is not zero. Uh, so this is, of course, a level alpha test. Why? Because if indeed we sample our single realization was from here, well, what is the probability of actually being in the rejection region, being here? It's exactly uh, 5%, right? It's uh, the probability of falling here. The, the area under the, under the curve here is 5%. Um, another decision function is uh, one that actually looks uh, both at uh, high values uh, of the realization or lower va low value uh, symmetrically uh, around, the, around the mean. So if, again, alpha is uh, 5%, then we're looking at the 97.5% uh, quantile of the standard normal, which is 1.96. 
and we are going to reject so, uh, if uh, our, our realization x is greater than 1.96 or smaller than minus 1.96. This is the rejection uh, region. And again, it's a pros, uh, uh, an alpha 5% uh, uh, level test uh, because the, the area under uh, the standard normal density of being greater than 1.96 or uh, lower than minus 1.96 is also 5%. And another decision function is one that actually uh, uh, rejects also for lower values of or and higher values, but not symmetrically. So here it will reject um, for if x is above the 1 minus 2 alpha over 3 uh, quantile uh, or uh, less than the alpha over 3 uh, quantile of the standard normal. And it's again an alpha level test. So these are the three, three uh, alpha level tests. Uh, and if we look at the power function of these three alpha level tests, uh, so the power function is a function of theta. Theta is what we want to learn, right? We want to decide actually specifically if theta is equal to zero or it's not zero. So at, because they are 5% level tests and at zero, they're all exactly um, the probability uh, of being in the rejection region when theta is equal to zero is exactly 5% for the three uh, decision functions that we have. However, they differ when, uh, say that when we're actually in the alternative. So what is the probability now of making uh, the, right, uh, the right choice if, we, if theta is indeed not zero of actually doing the rejection? So here they are very different. If theta is actually positive, uh, then the best one is the one that uh, only considers, uh, only rejects for large values of x. Uh, the second best is uh, is the one for that uh, only um, that treats asymmetrically the positive and negative values and favors positive values. And uh, the the worst one is uh, the one that actually treats symmetrically both positive and negative values. Whereas if theta is less than zero, then uh, there is and there's no power for uh, the first test that only looks uh, rejects if uh, we have uh, positive values of x, high values of x. And actually, the one that is best is uh, the one that uh, treats uh, the two tails uh, symmetrically. So what we see here is that the reason it depends on theta, which we don't know. Uh, uh, which uh, which decision function is actually best? There is no best one. I mean, if theta is equal to one, then the best is uh, uh, the decision of the black curve. If theta is equal to minus two, the decision, the best decision is uh, the, uh, the the one from uh, the, the blue curve. So we don't have one that dominates uh, over, over the other. What is typically done is that uh, if uh, you don't have any reason, you think what you want to, to infer on a, your research uh, hypothesis is that theta is indeed not zero, but you don't have any inclination. I mean, think about a machine. Uh, you think now that it's uh, out, of, uh, uh, out of balance, uh, so it's no, no longer an exact, the expectation is no longer zero, but you don't know if it's now overestimating or underestimating. You have no reason to, this, uh, to but you want, you want all the time to, to check that indeed uh, um, uh, it, it's, it's out of control. Then, uh, then uh, you would choose uh, the, the this one, the one that uh, treats symmetrically both positive and negative values. Whereas, uh, if uh, you believe that actually uh, the machine is out of control, but uh, now the expectation is uh, positive, but you're not sure, you want to still be able to detect also if it's very clear that it's negative, then uh, you may actually choose uh, um, uh, the blue one here. Whereas, uh, if uh, you know that if it's out of control, it can only be positive, then of course uh, you will uh, um, uh, you you will choose uh, this one. So so it's uh, this is where uh, again there's no one uh, uh, contrary to um, to maybe pure math uh, uh, that there there's there, there isn't necessarily one good answer. There can be many uh, quite a few good answers. Um, so, so which is, uh, now if we consider instead of uh, uh, this alternative, that theta is not equal to zero, if we consider the alternative only that uh, what we want to detect is that theta is positive, here we have actually uh, one good answer, and uh, only one good answer uh, for, for, this, uh, for this example. And that's, uh, um, that's nice. Um, so uh, if we want, uh, so 
So if uh, the null hypothesis that theta is uh, at most uh, zero and the alternative is that the expectation is greater than zero, uh, and we want an alpha level test, then uh, the blue and the red ones are of course not alpha level tests, right? Because now the null is all the theta values until zero and the probability of, uh, if theta is equal, for example, to minus two, the probability of being, uh, um, uh, the, the, the probability of making a rejection is far greater than 5% uh, for the red and the blue corals. So of course they are not alpha level tests, 5% level tests. The only one that is a 5% level test is now uh, the, um, uh, the decision uh, of, of, the, of the black curve. And this uh, decision is actually not, not only the best out of these three for this problem, but it is uh, the best that uh, we can do for this problem. Uh, so this is what I'm going to now uh, try to uh, um, explain to you uh, about uh, why is this the best that we can do and how we can actually uh, use, uh, it, it's an optimization problem and th this is the solution and there are a lot of very interesting optimization problems actually in, in the in hypothesis testing. So I'm going to, to, to discuss that a bit. Uh, unless there are questions about uh, the, the first part, the first, subsection of the first section. Okay. Okay, so um, remember our, our uh, what we said was that uh, we first constrained the probability of type one error to be at most alpha, say alpha of 5%. Okay, so the probability of a false positive is at most 5%. We require that, this is a constraint on our decision function. We require it to be a alpha level test. And then what we want among all alpha level tests, we want the best one. And we saw that there isn't necessarily a best one, uh, but uh, for, for when we tested uh, uh, theta equals zero versus theta not equal to zero, but there is always a best one uh, if uh, our hypothesis are simple hypothesis, which means that uh, our big theta naught is only a single value and our uh, big theta one is also only a single value. Uh, so if we think about the normal means problem, it's really that the expectation under the null is a specific uh, number, uh, a specific uh, value say zero and the expectation on the alternative is another specific value say uh, one. Then uh, we have a best test and the best test has uh, the following form. Uh, basically it looks at the likelihood uh, ratio. It looks here, uh, what we have in the numerator is the density of our data if the alternative is true. So if theta is equal to theta one, that's in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have the density uh, of our data if theta is indeed equal to theta naught. So this is uh, the likelihood under the alternative uh, divided by the likelihood under the null. It's called the likelihood ratio. Okay, so once we observe our excess, once we observe our data, we can just compute this likelihood ratio. If we think about uh, uh, height, uh, we sampled our height. Now we have uh, the density of the height under uh, theta one, if we know theta one and the density of the height under theta zero. Um, and then, so we look at this ratio and it's, so the likelihood ratio, if it's small, we don't reject. And if it's large, we do reject. Okay, so this is, this is the decision and it's, it makes sense because what it means, what does it mean that the likelihood ratio is large? It means that uh, the probability of observing exactly what we observed if theta is equal to theta one is much larger than the probability of observing what we observed if theta was theta zero, okay? So we have strong evidence uh, against, uh, against the null. So when this ratio is large, we want to reject. Uh, now, the only thing that's not defined here yet is uh, C. How should G C be chosen? Okay, we have, we know the densities. Uh, once we observe, uh, we have our data, we can uh, plug it in and then uh, have uh, computed the, the likelihood ratio. And, uh, the decision, the decision function, uh, the cutoff C is chosen so that 
the, our constraint is satisfied. Okay, so now uh, for simplicity, x is uh, these are only densities. I mean, everything is true also for probabilities and when x is discrete, etc. But I'm not going to uh, uh, these details just just uh, for convenience and simplicity. So so. Um, if X is continuous, for example, it's a norm, it comes from a normal density, then we can always have the cutoff so that uh, uh, the probability of a type one error is exactly alpha. So this is how we choose our C. And this is the best, um, <clears throat> and this is the, the absolute best uh, uh, optimal decision rule that we can make for any X that comes uh, from either this or this. Th this will be the best, uh, uh, the best rule. What do I mean by best rule? It means that <clears throat> it's, it is an alpha level test. And among all alpha level tests, the probability of indeed rejecting the null when the null is false, when we're here, is the highest. So uh, th this is the optimality uh, criteria. And, uh, okay, so this is the, the celebrated name and personal name. It's one of the most uh, important, uh, maybe basic uh, uh, lemmas in statistics and definitely in hypothesis testing. So, so exactly what I said, the first year is just uh, written uh, that the decision rule, this star here that I defined uh, here, it's the best for this problem for testing whether X is uh, from the data generation with data not versus the alternative that it is from the data gen generated from the probability distribution uh, index by theta one. And the proof is uh, very simple. The proof is just this one slide. Um, I'm going to go over it. Uh, I'm going to try to, but uh, please stop me. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, it's nice that it's really, really simple. It's just an optimization problem. And it seems that, uh, you know, for every X, for every data, you actually need to decide whether it's, uh, it's, it's an infinite dimensional binary problem because we have a decision rule for any possible X uh, uh, data, data, that, uh, data that we have. And we want uh, to find the optimal rule so that the power, the probability of making a rejection is, is the highest. Okay, so this is what I call first uh, before beta of theta one. I'm, I'm just writing it now uh, explicitly like that. So uh, because this is exactly the probability that D is equal to one when um, uh, theta is equal to theta one. Okay, so we want to maximize this subject to the constraint that the probability that D is equal to one uh, if theta is equal to theta zero is exactly alpha. Th this is our optimization problem. And it turns out to have uh, uh, the solution, this star uh, that was in the, in the previous uh, slide. And how, how do we see that? So, so one way of just uh, showing this is let's denote F star, the maximal power indeed for all uh, subject to these constraints. From all decision rules, the maximum power, the, from all alpha level tests, the maximum power uh, that we can get is this value F star. So now I need to just show that uh, our decision policy D star indeed uh, provides uh, this power F star. Okay, this is uh, the optimal value that um, uh, that can be achieved in terms of power. <clears throat> so uh, the proof, uh, one uh, way of proving it is just let's write the Lagrangian. Okay, so we have the objective, we have the constraint, uh, we have. Uh, our uh, uh, Lagrange uh, multiplier lambda here. Uh, now we can write this again, uh, just like this. And we remember what we're looking for is the D, uh, the, the optimal D. So let's see, what, what is D that maximizes the Lagrangian? Well, this is super simple because uh, D is just, uh, can have a binary decision, it's either zero or one. So of course, what we want is to put it at value of one when uh, what we have here, which is the density under the alternative minus lambda times the density under the null is greater than zero, then we will put D is equal to one. And otherwise we'll put D is equal to zero when it's negative, right? Which is exactly the form that we have there, except there we, have a, we had a specific lambda that satisfied all the constraint, right? Uh, saying that uh, we reject only if G of theta one minus lambda G of theta zero is greater than zero is the same as saying that the ratio 
of the density under the alternative divided by the density under the null is greater than lambda, then we reject. Okay, so this is clearly the rule that maximizes the Lagrangian, right? So, so D lambda is uh, the maximizer of, of the Lagrangian. It looks like that. Now we know that uh, the, for any lambda, it's true that uh, if we plug in in the Lagrangian R, the, this maximum value D of lambda, it's necessarily greater than the maximum value that we have here because we maximize not only over uh, all uh, rules that satisfy the constraint, but over all rules. If yeah, among all rules that satisfy the constraint, the Lagrangian is exactly uh, just, uh, just this, right? Because uh, this is zero. So of course uh, we have uh, this uh, inequality here. Now th this is true for any Lagrange multiplier. It is true in particular for the Lagrange multiplier of our D star, which is exactly of that form. D star is of the form D lambda for particular lambda, which is C. So we know already that uh, the Lagrangian, when we put in D star and the Lagrangian multiplier C is greater or equal than the maximal power that we can, we can get. But in addition, uh, what we have here is our D star is such that uh, it satisfies, it's feasible, it satisfies the constraint. So it's necessarily less than or equal to the maximum value. So it has to be uh, the, uh, the optimal solution. So this is just a proof uh, of uh, this uh, optimality uh, result. So we know if we have a simple hypothesis, uh, both uh, just, just value, one value for theta, both in the, in the now, and in the alternative, then we know uh, uh, how, um, uh, how to find the best uh, decision rule uh, possible. And um, let's just look at uh, the normal means problem again. This is true for any density or for any probability. But uh, let's look for this particular uh, density. Okay, so we have uh, the null that theta is equal to zero, the alternative that theta is equal to uh, theta one. The likelihood ratio now is the density, and uh, again, uh, for simplicity, just one data point. Of course, in general, we have a uh, sample uh, greater than one. Uh, the density under the alternative divided by the density under the null, uh, just uh, from plugging into the uh, uh, normal density, this is what uh, it comes, this is the likelihood ratio. And our optimal rule will reject for large values of this likelihood ratio. So when will it reject? The Neyman Pearson lemma tells us, okay, if theta one is greater than zero, it will reject for large values of X because if theta one is positive, then this whole expression will be large if X is uh, positive. How positive? Well, we want uh, it to be an alpha level test. So the probability of uh, the rejection has to be equal to alpha if the null hypothesis is true. So, so uh, it will be, uh, uh, the, uh, we will reject if X is greater than on one and a half of quantile of the standard normal distribution. Now, if theta one is less than zero, then the Neyman Pearson lemma tells us that uh, actually we reject for small values of X because if theta one is negative, then in order to make all this entire thing uh, uh, large, we need X also to be negative. And how negative? Well, uh, the cutoff so that we have an alpha level test. So this is very interesting because what we see here is actually that our rejection rule doesn't depend on the actual value of theta. It only depends on the sign of, uh, of the value. And this is already becoming practical now because typically we don't know, uh, we want to uh, uh, identify that theta is greater than zero, but we don't know exactly what value it will take. Uh, but we know that for any theta greater than zero, this is the best rule possible. So we say that this is the uniformly for all theta under, under the alternative most powerful test. So for example, if, if here we have this, uh, uh, this alternative that the expectation is positive, uh, then the best rule for any theta one uh, under the alternative is this one. So it's a uniformly most powerful. And of course, uh, for the negative, uh, it, it's this one. Now, if uh, the, the, the first problem that I showed you that was that the alternative is just that theta is not equal to zero for this, the uniform and most powerful test doesn't exist uh, because, um, because we know that it's, uh, uh, this is the optimal rule if theta one is greater than zero, and this is the optimal rule if theta one is less than zero. So we can't have two values under the alternative for which uh, it's the same optimal rule. So there's no way out of, of that one. Um, 
But these uniformly most powerful tests, they are practical in uh, some important application, uh, for example, in clinical trials, uh, um, which uh, uh, we hear about uh, a lot uh, in the last couple of years uh, with uh, all the vaccines that are coming uh, uh, and, and helping the world. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, uh, we want to carry out a clinical trial and we need to decide uh, what sample size to use. So typically, uh, so we have uh, patients that are randomized into two treatment arms, uh, the control arm and the, and the, the treatment, uh, uh, the, the treatment that we want to infer on, uh, the, its efficacy. And uh, we, the sample size is calculated to achieve maximal power at a pre-specified treatment effect, subject to the constraint that there is no treatment effect, say. And we know the direction of the treatment. I mean, if uh, we have a vaccine, we know that it has to uh, reduce uh, the number of, uh, um, reduce the risk of, of actually uh, getting COVID. Um, Okay, so, uh, so 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 here, this type of the Neyman Pearson uh, lemma and uh, its optimal solution they come in uh, very handy. Um, so um, I'm already past the time for the break. I'm just going to uh, say uh, very briefly. Just uh, nowadays, actually, we have more than one hypothesis that is seriously tested. So actually, we have we can have very interesting optimization problems, not just with one decision rule that we want uh, to optimize uh, for for just one hypothesis, but the vector of decision rules. Because say we have two hypotheses, and we want to make uh, the decisions in a certain sense uh, uh, best uh, for both uh, both hypotheses. So this is a uh, very interesting, to my to my view, very interesting uh, um, field of research. Uh, how to design actually optimal procedure. Uh, when we have uh, more than one uh, hypothesis simultaneously tested. Uh, if we take uh, the COVID example, then it can be, for example, that uh, uh, we want um, uh, to learn about uh, two doses, say two regimes of the treatment uh, uh, or, or two subgroups of uh, people and uh, uh, for, for which uh, there is a treatment effect because it could be that there is a treatment effect uh, uh, for a drug on uh, elderly people, but not on, on young people, for example. And how to design uh, optimal uh, testing procedures is uh, something we actually dealt with in our group. Um, so we do have um, a, a blog that, that talks about that, about how generalizing name and person name of a multiple uh, hypothesis testing problem when we don't have just one, but more than one. And we have a series of papers, uh, one that is uh, specific for clinical trials, one that lays out more the mathematical foundations, and one that actually deals with a very high dimensional, not only from going from one to two or from uh, or two to three, but uh, uh, actually considering thousands of hypotheses or millions of hypotheses uh, simultaneously. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, uh, optimization problems, you may, you may take a look. Um, and that's it for the first uh, part of the talk. So I guess uh, we can take a break. Any, any questions? Questions or comments or maybe questions from people online? I have one question. Please. Uh, so is it possible to reformulate this uh, uh, lemma, uh, Nyman Pearson lemma in uh, more geometric terms, somehow translated uh, to the problem um, of uh, scalar products in Hilbert spaces. I, I'm more Hilbert space minded, so when I see an integral of a product, I try to visualize, visualize this as a, as a yes, scalar they... product in some Hilbert space. Yeah, I mean, this is it's it's more general. It's, it doesn't have to be. Uh, I mean, uh, this uh, measure here, I, I wrote it like this. So yes, of course, it's uh, uh, you know th this entire thing can be also uh, you know uh, dg dg one dg zero uh, more generally for for different measures. If, if that's what you mean. Uh, no, no, I I just simply meant that. Uh, uh, my, my question is whether uh, viewing this problem as a problem in a Hilbert space, uh, does it actually help or, or not? 
I don't know. I'm not sure. I, uh, since since the problem can be translated as uh, the maximization of uh, scalar product uh, with with some constraints, yes. which is also given in in terms of scalar product equal to something, but I'm not sure whether it is the right way to think about it. <laughs> Okay, you see, we have theoretical people. Here. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, here the decision is a binary. So in terms of scalp, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure how to answer this. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, it's fine. Okay, let's let's uh, um, don't worry about that. So, uh, well, uh, we shall make uh, a break until five past ten. And I must say that the level is uh, great. I mean, uh, I really appreciate your efforts to explain so in a, such an elementary way. Thank you very much. I mean, it's a, it's a very good level. Okay, okay so we, we will re, uh, reconvene at five past 10. Okay. okay, go ahead with your second part, please. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about uh, a specific hypothesis of independence. The knowledge is the hypothesis of independence, and the alternative is that uh, we don't have independence. Uh, so we will start uh, with uh, two univariate random variables, x and y. Uh, they have uh, 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 densities fx and fy. The cumulative densities are denoted like this. And uh, under the null hypothesis, they are independent. So um, uh, basically, the joint distribution of x and y factors out to the product of the marginals. For uh, and, and and this is true in, in the entire uh, uh, in the entire space. Uh, what we have is um, an independent copies from that joint distribution, and it's denoted by little xi, little yi. Uh, and uh, on this, uh, we base the decision whether to reject this null or not. So uh, here, uh, so the question is how to do that, how, how, to, how to decide whether the null hypothesis is false and indeed we have dependence. Uh, there is no most uh, powerful uh, uh, test. It's, uh, um, this hypothesis is not simple. It's not like one theta naught uh, that we have. Uh, but uh, we have a pretty nice uh, policy of how, how, to, uh, how to go about actually doing this inference. Um, okay, uh, so before that, I just, before I show you how, how to test the null hypothesis of independence, which is a super basic uh, um, problem in statistics, uh, it's uh, years back. Um, just to make sure what we, to understand what we mean by dependence in, in the real uh, practical sense. Uh, so here, uh, th these are, this is uh, in the wikipedia.org page on Pearson correlation. So uh, Pearson correlation quantifies uh, linear relationships. Uh, and uh, uh, it's pretty easy also to uh, discover monotone relationships. But what we're interested in is actually discovering any type of relationship. So these, uh, what we have here is uh, seven, uh, seven plots, uh, and e each of them uh, are not uh, monotone. And in fact, any uh, tool for uh, inferring on a monotone relationship will, will fail uh, in, in these plots here. Uh, but uh, in most of them, there is actually dependence. So for example, here, okay, so we have the X, uh, 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 th th these are, um, it's not a very high quality uh, plot, but, but uh, we have points here from the joint distribution. Uh, if we plot uh, these points, uh, they have a W shape. Okay, so clearly knowing X gives me information on Y. X and Y are dependent, even though uh, the dependent is highly non-monotone. If X is very low or very high, then uh, Y also tends to be uh, t t tends to be high, but uh, afterwards there is a region where it tends to be low, and then if X is in the middle, then uh, Y is high again. So definitely if we know the value of X, we have information on uh, the value of Y. Uh, and, and this is true except for one uh, panel here. Uh, which panel? Uh, 
the, that is actually the, the null hypothesis is true. And so here the null hypothesis is clearly false. In which panel is it uh, uh, the, true that X and Y are, are independent? No. Does anyone want to? The last one. The, this one here, right? Uh, the, the, the right one, exactly. Um, and that's uh, because here we have, uh, so we have a strange marginal distribution, which is like two clusters, uh, um, probability half uh, uh, X can be in this cloud, probability half it can be in this cloud. This is the realization here and the same uh, for Y, but knowing X doesn't give me any information about uh, Y uh, uh, because uh, uh, given X, the distribution of Y is exactly the same for any X. So here, this is a realization of actually a true null hypothesis uh, that uh, the data is indeed independent, uh, but all the other uh, are, are realizations of uh, um, uh, dependent variables. There is a relationship between X and Y. And our problem is uh, we want to rule out uh, the independence and actually be able to discover any type of relationship. Okay, it's not functional relationship, it's not monotone relationship, it's really any type of relationship, that's what we want to discover. Um, and the question is how to do that. And there is a very, uh, so this is an approach. Uh, the approach is a permutation test that is uh, completely uh, non-parametric. It makes no assumptions whatsoever, no model assumptions, for example, that uh, the X comes from a uh, normal distribution and Y comes from a normal distribution. We make no such assumptions. Um, it's, uh, the, 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 the approach of permutation tests is valid uh, always. Um, and uh, so I'm going to first dis discuss it and then uh, the, the key element that we still need in order to actually be able to uh, discover relationships. So uh, we have our pairs of data. Remember, we have uh, uh, n pairs x, i, y, i. Now uh, let's uh, take the uh, denote by the vector x here, the order statistics just of the x's, and uh, the vector y, the order statistics just of the y's. So without looking at who is paired to who. Uh, then uh, let's uh, denote by calligraphic SN the permutations of the elements. So the cardinality of SN is just uh, n factorial. For any permutation, for any uh, of the n elements, let's denote by uh, sigma of y uh, the permutation of the order statistics uh, for that. Uh, so uh, uh, if uh, sigma is uh, just the identity, then we will get exactly this vector of order statistics. But if uh, it uh, uh, flips uh, two and one, then we interchange uh, these two observations, et cetera. So now uh, uh, the key uh, thing that enables us to do uh, non-parametric without any assumptions uh, uh, to inference on whether X and Y are actually dependent is, uh, is this fact that if the null hypothesis is true, if, uh, if indeed uh, knowing X gives me no information on Y, then actually the pairing is completely random. Right, it doesn't matter who is paired to whom, it's just one realization, but uh, effectively it's just that I took a sample of size uh, uh, n from the excess, so from the marginal distribution of x, so it's, uh, and another one from y, and it's just uh, the order was completely random. So the probability of, of observing any pairing of x's and y's conditional, let's condition on uh, the fact that we observe these specific n x's and these specific n y's, then this probability is one over n factorial. Okay, so, so once we have that actually for any test statistics, so a test statistics is a summary of our data. And for our purposes, we can think of what we want is really uh, to have a certain summary uh, that, um, that actually, uh, for example, it looks, uh, it, it will tend to receive large values if actually uh, there is dependence between uh, X and Y. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so, so uh, uh, I don't know, you can, you can think of the Pearson uh, correlation, say, uh, between uh, X and Y and as one, and one set test statistic, but it's no good because it's just for, um, good for <clears throat> when, when, when the data is monotone and, uh, um, and actually linear, 
but uh, but, but more generally, any any test statistic uh, that that you choose, that once you observe uh, your data, uh, you can have a value, uh, then uh, actually uh, you know how it is distributed. These test statistics uh, are under uh, under the null, conditional on the observed order statistics, uh, because you know that. Uh, if you, instead of take the original um, pairing, you take any uh, random pairing and you recompute uh, the test statistic, then each one of uh, the realization has actually a chance uh, one over n factorial. So the idea is, well, what we want is an alpha level test. So let's just take the quantile, the one minus alpha quantile, uh, of, uh, of this null distribution. And uh, let's reject if what we observe is actually greater, more extreme than this quantile and not, a, and not reject otherwise. So this is an uh, alpha level uh, test. So this is actually a recipe for uh, doing alpha level tests uh, without uh, any assumptions uh, whatsoever. And uh, of course, in general, we don't need, really need, I mean, n factorial, say if uh, n is equal to 100 n factorial, it's not, it's not possible to go over all of them. We can just do a Monte Carlo sam sample uh, in order to estimate this uh, one minus alpha quantile. And then uh, our, uh, all that's left is just uh, to, um, to compute uh, the, the actual observed test statistic. And then uh, if it's greater than the one minus alpha quantile, we decide on reject, otherwise not. And because it's a minus one, one minus alpha quantile, we know that it's an alpha level test. So we satisfy the constraint that we talked about before of the fact that the probability of type one error is at most alpha. Now, the big question is how to actually, what, what is a good statistic? And the good statistic is the one that has a lot of power that if indeed X and Y are dependent, then the probability of actually uh, making the decision to reject, which means uh, receiving uh, a realized value greater than the one minus alpha uh, quantile, uh, will uh, this probability is large. So, so this is a recipe for any type of test statistic and all that is left and all that I'm going to do from now on is actually to actually uh, show you some candidate, good candidates for the test statistic team. Once we have it, we know how to, how to proceed. We have the null distribution, which is just recomputing the test statistic for uh, any uh, uh, random pairing. And uh, the, then we get the null distribution. We have our uh, one minus alpha quantile. And so therefore we have the rejection region and the decision uh, to make. Uh, so, so this is all that is left. It's just, uh, we use permutation tests. Uh, all that is left is to define uh, um, a test statistic uh, that is large when uh, when the data is actually when x and y are actually dependent, and uh, and, and and therefore has good power. Okay. Uh, so uh, here is uh, one example of a relationship. This is real data. Okay. So this is uh, uh, one. It's a gene expression. One gene versus another gene, and. It, Maybe it looks like uh, there is a, a certain relationship between them, uh, but uh, there's a sort of error form here. Uh, but it's um, it's a complex relationship. It's definitely not monotone. It's not functional. This is what we want to, to be able to discover though, this type of relationship uh, with with a test. So so the, and and this is quite common now in in uh, modern application. Uh, what we're looking for is complex relationships. Uh, so here we have uh, two gene expressions, and we if they're not dependent, we want to know that indeed uh, they they are co-expressed. This will uh, enable if we give a list now of uh, co-expressed genes, it enables the scientist to continue the investigation to further uh, the understanding of uh, uh, the biology. Uh, now the also, uh, it, 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 what we what we typically have is a very noisy relationship. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we have relationships, but but they're hard to detect. Uh, so, we, it's really important to have uh, good power. And uh, the last thing is that uh, we don't usually test just uh, one uh, relationship, just two genes. Uh, but we have a lot of genes that we're testing uh, together. So, for example, here. Uh, we have 300 pairs um, 
of uh, data points, but each data point is actually uh, the expression of uh, uh, 94 genes. And now we want to have uh, all the uh, find all the co-expressions. So we have 94 choose two uh, plots like this. And out of them, we want to discover uh, the ones uh, that uh, uh, where, where uh, the genes are co-expressed. So we have a large amount of uh, potential findings. Um, okay, so what do we require from uh, our test? Uh, so what we want, uh, the, this uh, T that we need to, uh, uh, to choose. Uh, so we would like uh, would like to have uh, omnibus consistency, which means that uh, if indeed we have uh, gathered enough data, then uh, we are going to uh, be able to discover the relationship if there is one. So with enough data, our test statistic will be uh, really large. Uh, with uh, probability one, it will be above the one minus alpha uh, quantile of the null distribution. And this is important because uh, we don't just seek uh, a monotone relationship or functional relationship, uh, but we really don't know how the genes are uh, co-expressed, but uh, we want to identify the ones that are uh, co-expressed. Uh, so this is called omnibus consistency, uh, the a test that guarantees that with enough uh, data, we will have power increasing to one to discover uh, uh, that the null hypothesis is false. Of course, uh, for a uh, uh, finite uh, sample size, because we don't, this is an asymptotic property uh, when the sample size goes to infinity, what uh, we want for finite sample size uh, is uh, that it works well. Um, and the last thing uh, that uh, we, uh, we want, uh, it's uh, a computational efficiency that can, uh, we can get from uh, this property called distribution freeness. Uh, so basically, if we think about uh, our, our, uh, to, uh, our example of uh, 94 choose two uh, genes uh, co-expressions that we're examining, uh, then uh, what we're suggesting to do with a permutation test is actually, okay, to compute uh, the test statistic and then to compute also the null distribution for every single uh, pair. Uh, which is uh, a lot of computations to do, even if we do Monte Carlo sample, not all, not uh, the 300 factorial, but only a subset of that, of course, in order to find the quantile, but the quantile will be different for every uh, pair that we compute. Unless uh, we uh, start with a distribution-free test, then the null distribution can be computed only once. And the way to do that is super simple. It's just, uh, let's, instead of uh, working uh, with a test that works on, on uh, the data, the original data, let's work on the rank data. So basically rank uh, the uh, N observations from X from one to N, rank the N observations from Y from one to N. And then still, I mean, uh, we, we have information on the dependence, of course, uh, um, based on uh, uh, for, for, for the ranks as well. And we can still discover it. And it turns out also to be uh, remarkably efficient uh, that uh, we don't, the fact that we moved from the original data to rank data uh, doesn't actually um, cause a lot of loss of power. Um, it can even be uh, better power uh, in, in various instances. So uh, this distribution fitness actually guarantees that we can tabulate uh, the null distribution before viewing the data. I mean, of course, if we move to RANS, then now we know in advance already that we will definitely have order statistics, the ranked order statistics are just numbers one up to N for X and one up to N for Y. So we can compute uh, the null distribution of our test statistic uh, for different pairings of the ranks of X and Y, and then, uh, and then we have just one uh, null distribution. So in the yeast samples, what it means is that uh, what we're left to do now that we look at the data, uh, we only need to compute the test statistic uh, for each of the pairs, but we already have the one minus alpha quantile uh, because it, the, the, our statistic was based on ranks. So this is uh, in modern um, applications where uh, we examine a lot of uh, hypotheses simultaneously. It's a very useful uh, property. Okay. So here is a, the, the uh, first uh, distribution-free uh, omnibus consistent uh, test uh, due to Hofting in 1948. 
And uh, what he, he said was the following, okay, let's uh, actually, so we have our X and Y's, we want to know if they are dependent. Let's take each observation point and partition the sample space into four quadrants based on that observation point. And now look at uh, the difference between uh, the observed uh, number in a cell versus uh, what we expect if uh, indeed uh, they are, um, uh, X and Y are independent. And uh, if we look, say, at the difference squared between the observed versus uh, the expected and independence, uh, the law, so under the null, we expect it uh, to be zero. Uh, uh, for n uh, for n large enough, or anyway, that the, the, the test statistic will be small. But uh, if there is dependence, then uh, we, the our test statistic will be large. Uh, so formally, uh, what uh, the test statistic looks at is um, you, you take uh, uh, one partitioning point, and you then uh, look at uh, the joint uh, empirical distribution. Uh, versus uh, the product of the marginal and the difference uh, squared. You do that for every point that will serve as a partition point, and this is the test statistic. Now, uh, so perhaps it's not immediate that it is a distribution-free uh, test statistic because it looks like it uses the data, X and Y, and not the ranks. But uh, the key observation is that cell membership where, where you are is the same regardless if you are looking at uh, uh, if you start with uh, the original data or uh, with the rank data, it will be the same. So actually what we can do before is just uh, every observation we move to its rank. So instead of Xi, we have Ri, uh, which is uh, the sum uh, of uh, the observations of X that are at most Xi. And instead of uh, yi, we have si, which is the sum of observations uh, in y uh, that are at most uh, yi. And now we have uh, these pairs, and these are the pairs that we're working for uh, with. And then we plug in here, uh, uh, this is the test statistic based on these pairs. Now, of course, these pairs, we know in advance that uh, uh, the, the order statistics of the r's is one up to n, the order statistics of the s is one up to n, so we can have the null distribution of this entire thing, and uh, therefore it's also distribution free. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so this is uh, Hofding's uh, um, uh, suggestion, which is uh, um, uh, which is old. Uh, one uh, more modern is uh, the suggestion we had a few years ago. Which was well, not let's not just partition uh, into uh, the space to two by two. Let's just look at all partitions because it could be that uh, actually uh, there is another partition that conveys better the relationship between x and y. So uh, we can and we have an efficient way of actually aggregating over all m by m partitions or uh, more generally m by l partitions. It doesn't have to be uh, symmetric, and actually we let also the data choose which is the best partition. Uh, so I'm going to um, briefly describe how how is that possible. I mean, it seems that uh, you know that, that that there are a lot of partitions, right? It's exponential, and all n by n partitions for n greater than two, uh, it becomes a real computational issue. So it may seem impossible. Uh, so the idea, just to be clear, is that uh, we have uh, we are going to partition. Uh, um, the x-axis into uh, m, uh, m sections, the y-axis into m sections, and then we have an m by m partition uh, here. And we're going to look uh, over all m by m partitions and then actually over all the possible m's as well. And this is possible. Uh, and so, so why does it look first that it's not possible? Well, if you think of the number of partitions for a given m, then it's exponential uh, because uh, you need to basically uh, select n minus po one points here and n minus one points here, and then uh, the number of partitions uh, uh, because of that uh, are, is uh, n minus one choose n minus one, uh, uh, the number of possibilities here and same here, and it's huge. It's a huge number. So how can we actually compute our test statistic? I mean, our aim is still compute T. We're just saying that uh, we can have a better T if we don't necessarily um, look only at two by two partitions. Uh, but if we go naively, uh, then uh, the idea is like this. Uh, we have, uh, so we have the set of partitions, which is enormous. 
And let's de denote by calligraphic C, uh, I, uh, the set of uh, M by M cells defined by the partitions. So these are the cells uh, for, uh, for a partition. Um, now, uh, OC is the observed number of uh, points in, in that cell. And EC is the expected number under the null. Um, uh, as, as, uh, num uh, the, what we expect under the null to see in that cell, which is, of course, under the null, it's really easy to compute. It's just uh, uh, proportional to the width and the length of the cell. Uh, so uh, we have the observed, we have the expected for each cell. Now, what would quantify a deviation from the null hypothesis of independence? It's if uh, all, uh, the observed and the expected are far away from each other because the expe expected is under the null. Uh, so far away uh, can be like this, or it can be like that, which is uh, Pearson's suggestion, or it can be like that, which is likely ratio connected to the mutual information su suggestion. Can be any, uh, it can be any number of uh, ways to quantify uh, deviations from independence. Then for a given partition, we just sum the evidence from each cell against uh, independence that the observed is actually far away from the expectation. And then we sum also over all the partitions. That's, even, that's just for one M by M, uh, um, uh, for, for one for one M, so so, but we, we consider all M by M partitions. So, so this is the naive way of computing it. It's not possible to compute it, of course. Um, why can we compute it? Uh, and we can compute it uh, reasonably well in uh, order of uh, standard size uh, to the fourth. And then, of course, uh, we have shortcuts also for this, uh, but I won't go into it. Uh, but why is it, uh, and we can do that at once for all possible ends. And the key, uh, there, there are two, two key observations why this is possible. First of all, although we have an exponential number of partitions, we don't have an exponential number of cells. We actually know exactly how many, uh, so a cell is, the, cells is defined by starting an endpoint in X and starting an endpoint in Y. Uh, so these are the number of cells that we own, uh, we have, okay? So it's just order n to the fourth uh, number of cells, although we have a lot more partitions than cells, but all the data is conveyed in cells. So the idea is that instead of uh, when summing, instead of iterating over partitions, right, which is what we do here, we first, uh, uh, we sum uh, the cells in every partition and then go over all the partitions. Well, uh, let's not do that, but uh, uh, let's uh, iterate, um, over cells instead, and because uh, and for each cell, uh, the score it doesn't depend on uh, on m. The the score here for each cell, we compute it like that. It's regardless of uh, what m we're using for the partition. So we can compute uh, the evidence against the null in each cell, and we have only order n to the fourth uh, cells. The other key. Well, excuse me. What what does it mean? Iterate over cells. Yeah, so it's the sum. So, so uh, the sum here, uh, we are uh, summing over all partitions. And then uh, for each partition, we are summing the evidence of cells. Uh, but uh, instead, we want, but we can't go over all the partitions uh, like that. What we want is to sum over uh, the cells. I'm going to, to, to detail soon uh, how and uh, just count the number of times each cell appears in, uh, in partitions. Oh, can, okay. okay. But we can interchange actually the summation. The summation, okay. okay. Yeah, con conceptually, that, that's what I mean. So, um, and, and the, the, the second observation is the fact, okay, so cells we have much less than, than, than partitions and for fixed, uh, um, for a fixed M, the number of um, partitions in which it appears, it only depends on the height and the width of that cell and not on the data. So we can actually compute it uh, offline. It does depend also on whether it's an internal cell or an external cell, but uh, that's a small detail. So basically instead of, this is our T, uh, our big T, our test statistic that we wanted to compute. We can't compute it because here it's a sum over an exponential number. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do this computation, which is just order n to the fourth. Uh, so what is this computation? Well, let's take first all the cells that are of the same width and length and compute uh, the, the, their sum. And then what we have here is just the number of uh, 
partitions of, uh, of size n by m uh, that for which uh, a cell of width w and length l uh, will uh, will appear uh, in, in uh, all when I go over all the m by m partitions. And this is a very simple uh, um, a simple computation that I can do uh, just offline. So this is already something uh, that I can actually uh, compute, and it's uh, uh, and, and it's uh, straightforward. Um, so what I'm going to do now is what we often do in statistics, and uh, since it's a crowd that is a more uh, theoretical math, then uh, what we're doing is we have methodology. And now uh, we want to actually see how it works on, uh, on real data. So we are comparing uh, different methods, different tests. Uh, so uh, what we have here is uh, really we have uh, 94 just two co-expressions of genes. Uh, so we have uh, 4,371 uh, um, uh, pairs of genes uh, that uh, we want to discover which ones of them uh, are not uh, dependent. They're not independent. And um, I've talked about uh, Hofding's test, uh, which does it by partitioning the space into two by two. And I've talked about uh, our uh, approach, uh, which uh, says, well, let's not only partition to two by two, but let's partition to M by M. Okay, so, and we can con consider two by two, uh, and, uh, but, but also more than that. Uh, here, when we consider two, it's not exactly Hofding, so that's why it's not, um, it's not the number of rejections that uh, Hofding has, because Hofting actually uses observed minus expected squared, and we used here, uh, I think, the likelihood ratio uh, statistic for each uh, within each cell. Uh, so let's see how. So, so Hofding uh, discovered two thousand and eight hundred and ninety uh, co-expressed genes. Uh, if um, if we didn't uh, uh, before Hofding, what what we had was just uh, a tool to discover a monotone relationship. So Spearman is just uh, Pearson the correlation on rank data, and it discovered much less. So so there are a lot of monotone relationships, or at least relationship with a strong enough uh, monotone component that we can discover it, uh, but less than Hofding. So we would miss a lot of uh, uh, co-expressed genes that don't have a monotone. Uh, uh, relationship. So Hofding is better than Spearman, uh, but uh, we can, uh, um, if we do n by n partitions, uh, we can gain uh, more because we can gain, uh, uh, we can go over more than uh, 3,000 as well. Uh, what we have here uh, is actually a data adaptive way of uh, uh, choosing the optimal value of n. The data, we let the data decide basically what is the optimal partition and then uh, uh, it does a very nice job. And so uh, we, dis we actually discovered the methodology that we have uh, ultimately in our paper uh, discovered uh, 3,300 uh, relationships. Um, okay, because we are examining simultaneously a lot of uh, uh, hypotheses, then uh, we need to compare to control for multiple comparisons. It's not enough to do each uh, hypothesis at level uh, 5%, uh, because then uh, we expect a lot of false positives. So uh, we have, this is a standard way of doing it, but I won't go into this since you just, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's more, uh, that, 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 that's uh, too much material. Um, okay. Uh, so that's it for univariate tests. Uh, I'm going to very briefly uh, go over uh, what happens when we have multivariate uh, random variables rather than univariate random variables, uh, unless there are any questions. Okay. So here we have the exact same setup uh, that we have X and Y under the null, the joint distribution factor is into the product of the marginal, except that now uh, we have multivariate vectors. Uh, X is in RP, Y is in RQ. Again, we have uh, N pairs uh, from the joint distribution. For the, and based on these, uh, we want to infer whether we can, uh, uh, whether this null hypothesis is false. And this, uh, again, in uh, modern uh, applications, uh, many times uh, we face uh, this problem instead of univariate random variables, we have multivariate. And we still, it's very important to know whether uh, indeed uh, X uh, contains information on Y, uh, whether they are indeed um, uh, 
uh, related. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have uh, in genomics, uh, we have multiple phenotypes, multiple uh, 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 multiple uh, outcomes, and we, we are asking uh, which uh, genotypes are uh, related uh, to them or which uh, sets of uh, genotypes are related. Uh, in, in the yeast example, uh, what we looked at is co-expression of genes. This was the univariate example, but actually the genes, they, they work together, they work in pathways. So we may actually, uh, if we know, and, and the scientists know already also the genes that work together, then we may ask whether uh, the pathways are uh, co-expressed. Uh, co uh, so here we have a set, a group of genes, uh, this is uh, X, and another group of genes, this is Y, and we're asking uh, whether X and Y are independent. And uh, or uh, uh, we can have uh, codependence between phenotypes and the entire vector of uh, environmental and genomic uh, variables um, it can be huge. Uh, the vectors can be very, very high dimensional. Uh, one application uh, is a microbiome studies. So our cells are uh, mostly uh, not us, uh, but uh, virus bacteria, the microbiome. So actually you can think about, it's a community, it works uh, together. So it's a set of a lot of uh, different uh, uh, different uh, bacteria. These are this is this is the community, the microbiome. We we count the prevalence of uh, of each one, and and it it varies by the way the prevalence in different areas of uh, of the body, and then we want to associate that to a certain uh, outcome, a certain uh, phenotype. Uh, so uh, uh, so this is a uh, high dimensional. It can be hundreds uh, of uh, of of. Uh, of species uh, in each uh, in each uh, area uh, and uh, body area, and then uh, we want to, we, we are asking uh, whether the distribution uh, uh, wh whether there is a relationship between uh, uh, this uh, the microbiome and uh, and a certain outcome or multiple outcomes. Um, so these are all modern application. We need a tool uh, to identify uh, these relationships. So what do we want from a test? Well, of course, uh, we want to be able to discover any type of uh, relationship. So this is the omnibus consistency that uh, we talked about uh, before, if we have a, a sample large enough. So it's not only uh, monotone type relationships, but any type of relationship between a multivariate X and multivariate Y, we want to be able to discover it. For finite samples, we want to have good power. Uh, distribution freeness can help a lot with the computation. So we don't need to uh, use permutations in order to um, each time when we have a lot of uh, uh, hypothesis uh, that we are simultaneously examining. Uh, what uh, we want, uh, this is something we didn't have for univariate tests. Uh, we want it maybe to, apply, to be able to apply it also when the dimension of the random vector is uh, greater than uh, sample size. So for example, uh, we have uh, the entire genotype, so an entire chromosome uh, for each person and what we want to associate it uh, with uh, uh, with uh, certain phenotypes, say uh, height, uh, cholesterol level, uh, etc., uh, then uh, we we can have a dimension that is greater than the sample size. We have a few hundred or few thousand people, uh, but uh, the vector that we are trying to correlate uh, is actually uh, of higher dimension, and uh, we want it to be simple. Simple is always better. So this is something we would like uh, would like to have. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, so, so, so there are various tests that are based on pairwise distances. Here's one that's uh, uh, recent, fairly recent and popular in statistics. Is one that is uh, that's as follows. It's called the distance covariance. It's sort of a, um, a generalization of the Pearson correlation for uh, for um, more general relationships. That was uh, the original idea. The way it works, it's super simple, so it's really nice uh, to describe it. It's uh, so we take the pairwise distance between the x's and separately between the y's. So now we have uh, uh, all uh, we have two n by n uh, um, matrices of uh, pairwise uh, distances, 
Then this is what uh, the test statistic is. This is our, well, I called it T uh, before. It's just this uh, very, very simple formula. What, uh, what they do is the following. Uh, yeah, okay, you take the pairwise distances in X, the N by N matrix, you center it. You center it so that the sum of the rows and the sum of the columns will be zero. You do the same for, uh, for Y, and then you just take the average of the dot product of the two N by N matrices. That's it, that's uh, the test statistic. Now, uh, this test uh, is, uh, satisfies almost all of the requirements uh, that uh, we had uh, before. It's definitely super simple. It's omnibus consistent. Uh, um, it has good power in, uh, for, for, many, for many alternatives, for many uh, alternatives that we encounter in practice. There is, one, uh, that, there is one thing that it doesn't satisfy, and that is that it is not uh, distribution free, uh, because this test statistic actually, uh, even if X and Y are independent, then uh, the, it's now distribution depend on the, uh, on the marginal distribution of X and Y. Um, OK. So, uh, and, and just to, to give you, why does it work, this super simple one? Why is it omnibus consistent? Why is it able to compute, to discover any type of relationship for, with n large enough? Is because, believe it or not, but this, uh, for a certain uh, distance, uh, it's actually uh, the difference between the joint characteristic function the minus the product of the marginal characteristic functions. It's, uh, so if you want details of this paper here, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Anyway, it's not distribution free, which means that the computational complexity is, uh, well, if you want the entire, it's, it's uh, computing the test statistics takes n squared uh, times, and then uh, you need another distribution. If you base it on B multi carlo permutations, it will be uh, this order of computations. If you base it on n factorial, it's usually not possible, n factorial times n squared. So B will be much smaller than n factorial, but it's still large. If we had a distribution free test, uh, that would be nicer. And then there are um, advances, very recent. I mean, this is really from the last uh, year about, uh, until now, we didn't have a distribution free uh, multivariate test based on, we didn't have a notion of distribution free multivariate rank. And now uh, with uh, the advances of uh, optimal transport uh, theory, uh, we do have, uh, uh, distribution free multivariate ranks. So the idea is okay, uh, just like we did with uh, univariate, that we transform the data to ranks and then plug it into um, uh, uh, a good uh, test statistic. We can do the same here. So we had uh, this uh, this new test here. Well, let's just do it on the multivariate ranks instead of on the original. The problem is it doesn't work very well um, for. Uh, uh, when, when the dimension is high, I mean, for, for when the for univariate statistics, you don't lose and you can even gain by moving from the original data to uh, the um, uh, from from the original to to uh, to the ranks. But uh, with multivariate, you lose. It seems like you lose uh, too much. Uh, another approach is the one that uh, we've suggested here, but I think I'm way over, so I'm not sure. Should I uh, should I stop here? It's all, uh, only three slides. Please uh, continue. Okay. So, uh, so another approach uh, which works well also for uh, higher dimension is uh, the one that we suggested uh, a few years back. Is uh, well, uh, we 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 want a distribution free multivariate test. There was no that back then. I mean, now we have these multivariate distribution uh, free tests, but back then we didn't have one that is also has the consistency uh, and distribution free guarantees. Uh, what we suggested, well, we do have it for univariate. That's what I talked about in uh, the previous uh, section. So let's just reduce the multivariate uh, by, uh, to univariate as follows. Let's do, choose a reference point and take uh, uh, the distance of the x's from the reference point, the distance of the y's from the reference points. Now I have pairs of distances from reference points rather than the original high dimensional x and y pairs. And, and now I'm applying an, uh, a distribution uh, free uh, consistent test like the one I, I suggested, uh, actually our M by N partitions ones on these univariate uh, pairs of uh, random variables. And this uh, will, um, the, the, and this, this will, if we reject the, 
uh, by the univariate test, then we're rejecting basically also the multivariate test. And uh, this works very well. And we have also the guarantee that if X and Y indeed are uh, dependent, then we, uh, except for measure zero reference points, we're unlikely to choose a bad one. Uh, then uh, definitely we will have a, we will see the dependence uh, here. Okay, this is what uh, this uh, theorem is about. So one uh, final point is uh, uh, so uh, our approach uh, was that multivariate omnibus consistent tests can be based on univariate tests uh, applies to distances from reference points. If the univariate test is consistent, so is the multivariate test. If the univariate test is distribution free, so is the multivariate test. Uh, so I'm basically suggesting a Hofting's test or our, our M by M extensions of it. The question is what, uh, why not? Why use only one reference point? Perhaps we're unlucky. How about using multiple reference points? So in the paper, we have one approach. Now with the advances of uh, multivariate ranks, we can think actually of uh, other approaches which may work better. I have a student uh, working on this. And I'll leave this, uh, and, but it's very interesting to actually uh, combine these two approaches. And actually, I think uh, that like, uh, a lot of geometrical uh, per perception uh, is needed to actually make advances in theory. So I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, research area. Um, and that's it. So uh, here I'm done. Uh, thank OK, you. thank you very much. Let's uh, thank the speaker. Are there any questions or comments? Oh, please, please take the mic. Okay. Uh, so you said that we can quite arbitrarily choose uh, our power function based on our knowledge about the data. And isn't that a, quite a big hacking? Oh, what, what uh, the partition? How, how do I do it with the partitioning? No, in the first part. In the M by N partitioning? Uh, no, when uh, at the first part, uh, that was uh, symmetric. Uh, yeah, this one here. One and non-symmetric one. Here, this one. How do I do it with the adaptive choice? Best at, at the beginning of the talk, we have uh, those curves, different curves and uh, different tests for them. I'm not sure what. I think the 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 drawings. I mean, person. Here, this one. This? Uh, no, no. Ah, okay. Previous. After this, after this, when I talk about partitioning. No, at the beginning. You mean uh, before? Th this is the okay. beginning. We don't Make need it. to hurry. Just uh, let's discuss. So, so I'm sorry. What, what your? Can you repeat the question? Because I think I have a good answer if I, if if you if I understand the question. But can you repeat it so I make sure I understand it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we could uh, choose our null hypothesis differently, uh, like uh, only considering uh, values that are bigger or uh, that absolute value is bigger. I see. Okay. So, oh, I see. I see. So you ah, curve. Oh, okay. Uh, the very first part that we have. Yeah, yeah, the very first part. I, see. I see. Yes. Yes. So, so here, the decision function has to be one. Uh, the uh, it's just uh, my point here was that there is no best decision function, but uh, you need indeed you need to decide a priori. Well, you don't have necessarily you don't have an inclination of whether. Uh, the theta will be positive or negative, then you choose this one, but you choose it a priori. You're right. If you you look at the data and based on that, uh, you choose the decision function, this is catastrophic, never do that. Uh, we have a lot of advances made in selective info where we can actually- what, When can we choose, it. for example, the third one? Like, are there any- well, here? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so if we think actually uh, that say uh, that we believe that uh, theta is greater than zero, we think that the expectation is indeed greater than zero, but we're not sure. 
Then uh, what we want is still to have power to detect if uh, theta is less than zero, but we put less, uh, but we weigh uh, the two sides uh, differently. So this is something uh, that can be done. For example, on prior knowledge, you know, that say uh, every day you actually test the machine to see if it's out of control. And you know that typically when it will be out of control, it will be actually uh, the biased uh, upward. So the, the, the expectation will be greater than zero, but sometimes it will also be uh, less than. So it may take you more time to detect this, less time to detect this, less data, but, uh, but it can be useful. There are applications where it can be useful. But you're right that it has to be, uh, the test itself has to be uh, decided uh, uh, without first observing the data and then deciding what the test is, because then you have no uh, guarantee uh, anymore that uh, the probability under the null uh, of rejection will be alpha. It will actually be much greater than alpha. And this is where p hacking, et cetera, comes in. Uh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, any other questions? Please go ahead. Yeah. So I very much like the idea of uh, uh, not uh, of distribution freeness. So maybe it's a very broad uh, question, but can you use some of the idea that you described to do some learning? So in the case of the gene expression data, so uh, you were able to achieve uh, uh, to discover uh, way. Uh, and higher number of uh, uh, relationships between pair. Mm -hmm. But to me, it seems that if I have a an higher and higher number of relationships, my model is becoming way more complicated. Um, so, so you can do, definitely uh, choose, uh, uh, use uh, testing more generally, like multiple testing for full prediction. I mean, there are a lot of words uh, that actually, because this is how uh, you do, you, you have a lot of variables uh, that uh, you want to decide which one to enter into the model in order to predict why better. And uh, how to select these uh, variables, you can do this by hypothesis testing. So this is something uh, that, uh, that, that is de de definitely done. And then, of course, you can use uh, distribution free. Actually, there are a lot of works, uh, I mean, on using the distance covariance, for example, to just uh, uh, do it uh, marginally or in groups. And then, uh, so, so, so we are in the multivariate uh, one here. Uh, so, so, so we have... Uh, you, 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 ha you have your predictor Y, and then you actually have a lot of Xs. Uh, you don't have just one. Uh, and, then, um, and then you use hypothesis testing, and any, I mean, the considerations for hypothesis testing can be uh, you want omnibus consistency, you want distribution freeness, uh, et cetera. And uh, you relate each of the lots of Xs that you can have with Y, and then you put in your model only those that pass a certain threshold. Uh, and uh, and then it's a much smaller uh, set, uh, but the test itself can still uh, the test that decides uh, whether to to indeed uh, that they are associated or not can can of course have the properties uh, of of the good tests that I, I labeled there that uh, uh, that we may want with all of these. Okay, thank you. Okay, there is. Uh... Maybe let me take one more question from the audience, please. Uh, yes, I, I would need to make first sure that I understand what we were doing. Uh, we were uh, calculating some values, but not on the whole like set, but uh, on the every subset of, of the set of points, right? Where we are uh, doing this, uh, what's it called? Uh, partitionings or? Yes. Uh, later on. Uh, yes, here. So uh, first, is it right that we have some statistics and and we are calculating it on uh, on a lot of partitionings of of the set, right? To to get some more information. Yes, yes. So so we take say here three by three partition. So we can have the observed versus the expected in each of the nine cells that we have here, but then we do it on all three by three partitions that we have. So, so we have uh, a lot of three by three partitions. Uh, and every time uh, we, we compute for each cell, the observed versus the expected and sum over the nine uh, cells. 
and then sum over all the partitions. Uh, okay, so is there some intuition? Why does it give us some new information uh, compared to just calculating uh, one value, taking one big partition yes. containing everything? Oh, but you can, what do you mean uh, an N by N partition? Yes. Exactly. But then you don't have any, you, you don't, you can't have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's too, it's too fine. So you're actually, so you need to have a balance uh, between, otherwise it's, it's sort of like with uh, overfitting, right? Because then uh, you will ha just have uh, one, one observation per cell. So it's no information about the observed versus the expected under the null. So actually the, the super fine uh, partitions are useless. What we actually show in the paper is the fact that, uh, I mean, if I go over all the three by three partitions or more generally over all M by M partitions, then the, these are the bad partitions, the one that have cells that are, that are tiny, that are just here. So necessarily it's just uh, one observation we can, because then the cells can either be one or zero. Only, so it's not enough of, uh, information of observed versus expected. But if we go over all uh, the n by n partitions, then the fraction of bad, these bad partitions that, uh, that are too fine is actually small. And that's why actually the test statistic that we have uh, is also a, a good uh, estimate of the mutual information, which, which actually characterizes uh, the strength uh, of the relationship uh, uh, between x and y. Okay, uh, let me just uh, look at the questions on chat. Okay, there's one. How do we find how the two variables are related to each other after finding out that there is a relationship? Maybe you can answer very quickly. Uh, so first of all, for univariate, uh, you, you can look at it. You can plot it. So, so that's, uh, that's nice. I um, mean, you can just plot uh, uh, x versus y. And then, OK, th th this, this came out. OK, I, I wouldn't look at uh, 5,000 plots. Uh, but now that this one came out because it's dependent, uh, then I can look at it and then uh, try to make sense of it. And then it's really further investigations. I mean, it's supposed to aid the, the biologist to, to continue further uh, into understanding uh, uh, what, what, what it is. For multivariate, it's uh, trickier because uh, really looking at uh, X and Y multivariate, uh, now you need uh, uh, some, some kind of uh, visualization uh, reduction uh, method like multidimensional scaling or uh, principal components, et cetera, just to, to be able to see, okay, uh, these came up, these pair came up, and now uh, uh, how do we see that they're really related and then further the understanding uh, later. But, but it's, 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 the, it's the next step, really. Once uh, you, you, the starting step is to know that there is a relationship, and then, of course, uh, there's a lot more work to do. Okay, so now let me, let me stop uh, recording.